It's good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord again. We agree with the psalmist. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. We are all pleased to be here today. The second Sunday in the month of June. Hello, Tom. This is George. Hello, George. What's on your mind? Said Tom. I am broke down in Los Angeles and I need $500 right away. There must be something wrong with this line, Tom said. I can't hear you. I say I want to borrow $500, George said. I can't hear a word you're saying. And the operator coming in on the line said, hello, hello, this is the operator. I can hear your party very plainly. Then you send him the $500. Well, we're not here this morning to talk about a loan. We're here to talk and to reflect on how may other people know that you're a Christian, that we are Christians? What is our topic? How may other people know that you're a Christian? When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as you fed the multitudes on the hillsides centuries ago, we ask you now to feed your people with your word. And grant that your word may find root in our hearts and grow and produce in your people true servanthood, true Christian living in the church and in the wider society. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Someone once asked Mel Trotter, the great mission leader, the question, how do you know that you have been saved? And he answered, I know that I am saved. That I have been saved. I am saved because I was there when it happened. Yes, if we have had an experience with Jesus Christ, if we have stepped closer to him, we know this in our hearts. But how may others know that we are Christians, whether we be young Christians or older Christians? Some people, when asked the question, if they are Christians, some people say, I hope so. I think so, or I guess so. That is not worth very much. We need to examine our experience to see whether it is genuine or not. A little boy who had been eating green apples had a stomach ache and when he was asked how he knew that the apples were green, the boy said, 
I have inside information. We ought to have inside information about salvation. We ought to know whether or not we have been truly saved. But how can the world know? How can other people around us know? A man may have a pin on the lapel of his coat telling us that he belongs to a certain organization. Well, a Christian could also wear a badge saying, I am a Christian. But that wouldn't mean a thing. It is what is inside that counts. And if we have the real thing on the inside, it will come out in various ways on the outside. And the world will know it. Notice from the passage we read from Acts that the apostles were living their Christian lives daily. And the world could say, we took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had an experience with Christ. Can the world, can others say that about us? Can others say, yes, I see you have had an experience with Jesus. How may others know that we are Christians? First thing I want to, the first point I want to raise with you today, uh, most times uh, I preach a three-point sermon. I, I tell you this is going to be a little bit more than three this morning. Point number one. Point number one. Can you read that please? Others may know that you are Christian by your attitude towards sin. So others will know that we are Christians by our attitude toward sin. An important part of conversion is repentance, which includes not only godly sorrow for sin, but true repentance involves turning away from that sin. If a man or woman goes back to his or her sin, the world has a right to believe that he or she has not really been saved. You see, the correct translation of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9 tells us that one who is born of God, born from above, does not continue to practice sin. He or she may slip sometimes, but he or she will not stay in that sin. There comes a time when after a Christian sins, he or she cries out to God and reaches his or her hand out to Christ and ask him to have mercy and to forgive him or her and restore that relationship. So people who, who become Christians and then backslide and stay in the sin and wallow in the sin, the world will not believe that such persons are really and truly Christians. One day you remember when Jesus walked down the road, he met a man who was devil-possessed. This man was dangerous to both himself and to others. He ran through the cemetery, cutting himself with stones. They bound him with chains, but he broke the bonds and ran wild. But Jesus broke those bonds and cast the devil out. And we read that the man went into 
ten cities and told what Jesus had done. And men and women saw the difference in the man and they marveled at the change. People ought to see the difference in us too. If we say we are Christians, people ought to see the difference that there has been a revolution, a change in our lives. We no longer love sin. There ought to be a change in us after we have been converted. Life is full of changes. Health changes us. Wealth changes us. Marriage changes us. But the greatest change ought to be the change brought about by our conversion. The world ought to see that the Christian has left his or her sin and that we are walking with the Savior with a change in our ways, a change in our behavior. Yes, our attitude towards sin ought to show the world that we are Christians. That's point number one. What's point number one? Others may know that we are a Christian by our attitude toward sin. We hate it. Point number two. Point number two, can I hear you? Others may know that you are a Christian by the things that satisfy you. Jesus, you remember, told about the rich farmer who ruled God out of his life. He found satisfaction in his farms, in his barns, in his grain. And we know that he was unsaved because what satisfied him was just material things. The Apostle Paul could say, my greatest joy is to know and serve Jesus. Forbid it, Lord, that I should glory save in the cross of Christ. We know that he was a Christian. We know what satisfied him. A pig wallows in the mud hole and is completely satisfied. But a sheep is not satisfied when he falls into the mud. And he gets out as quickly as possible. Some people wallow in sin. This is the thing that satisfies them. And this tells us that they are not Christians. Others fall into sin and are miserable in it. They get out as soon as they can. We know that they are saved. They have a spark of Christ within. And they are satisfied only when they get back to that relationship with Christ. You remember that after the flood, Noah sent out a raven and a dove. The raven did not come back. He enjoyed feeding on decaying carcasses. That satisfied him, so he didn't return. The dove was not satisfied with this food, so the dove came back. Noah knew which was the raven and which was the dove. He knew by the things that satisfied them. It is the same way with church members. If we can be fully satisfied only with the things of this world, 
this is this, a sign that we are not really saved. If it takes God, the business of God to satisfy us, the world can know that we are Christians. Yes, the closer we come to God, the more the real Christian realizes that the world cannot satisfy. The things that satisfy prove whether we are Christians or not. So, others will know that we are Christians by our attitude toward sin. That was the first point. The second point that others will know that we are Christians by the things that satisfy us. Point number three. Let's hear what point number three says. Read it please. Others may know that you are Christian by the attitude you have toward other people. There is just one attitude for the Christian to have. And that is the attitude of love. Jesus said, by this shall all people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A member in a certain church one day said um, to the pastor, I hate, I hate that person. I hate him. The pastor said, that the gospel had little effect in that church. That is not strange. The Spirit of God simply does not work in the atmosphere of hate. One reason why the world has such a poor conception of Christianity is because we Christians at times show so little love toward others. When we have been with Jesus, we sow the seeds of love, not hatred. When we have been with Jesus, we sow the seeds of peace, not disturbance. Goodness, not evil. When we have been with Jesus and have had an experience with him, we do not insult others. We do not belittle others and put them down. Rather, we are gracious. We love generously, we care deeply, and we speak to others kindly. We speak with kindness, knowing that we cannot unsay a cruel word. We cannot unsay a cruel word. Yes. Am I a Christian? Are you a Christian? Well, show it. We show it by loving people. Love pities the weak and tries to help the sinful. The Christian loves and forgives the unlovely as well as the lovely. The heart of the Christian goes out to everyone. The world will know that you are Christian by your attitude toward others, other people, how you treat them. That was point number three. Point number four. Others will know. I, I, it's there. Read with me. Others will know that you are a Christian by your attitude towards Christ's church. 
Scripture tells us that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If we love him, we will love his church as well. If we love Jesus, we love the church for which he died. And we will not be stumbling blocks in his church. But we will be building blocks. You know, sometimes people in the church can become stumbling blocks. Rather than building blocks. Those who love the church do not behave as stumbling blocks. But as building blocks. They do not line up with the the destruction gang but they line up with the construction gang are you a stumbling block or are you a building block what is the true christian's attitude toward the church if a person is saved he or she will want to worship god to be in God's house on God's day and to lift up our hearts toward the Heavenly Father. If a person is saved, he or she will want to hear the gospel as it is preached and taught. The sweet news that Christ loves us and died for us and rose again and that he is ready to receive and to welcome and to save anyone who comes to him by faith so you love you love the church and you love the gospel and you love the teaching of the gospel see you at 6 30 this evening see many more of you at 6 30 this evening because you love your church and you love the gospel I love the teachings of the church. See you on Wednesday evening in home group study. Oh yes, if we are serious. If a man or woman never comes to hear the great story, if he or she does not love the gospel, is he or she a child of God? The world will not think so. You may think so about the world. Others will not think so. And you won't be a good example to others. If a person is saved, he or she wants to have fellowship with, with fellow believers, kindred spirits. We know that we have passed from death to life, Scripture says, because we love the brethren. If we say we belong to God's church and have no desire to have fellowship with other believers. Is he or she a Christian? I tell you, the world will not think so at all. If a person is saved, he or she wants to have a share in the work of God's church. He or she wants to have a share in the work that the church is doing for God. He or she brings to the church some of the money which God has given him or her because he or she wants to have a part in the work of the church. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And because he so loved, he gave. And his love for us will constrain us to give. And we are challenged to give generously so that the work of the church can advance. If a man or woman never wants to give out of what God has first given, is he or she saved? The world will not think so. Before his conversion, Paul tried to stamp out Christianity. After his conversion, he, he said, sadly, I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. He knew that he was not saved when he did that. The world will not think that we are saved if we persecute the church, if we neglect the church, 
if we badmouth the church, the world will not believe that we are saved if we behave in ways that are not Christian and give the church a bad name. So friends, what a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord another Lord's Day. What is our topic today? What is our topic for the sermon? Are you there? What is our topic? How may others know that we are Christians? I raised four points with you already. The world will know that we are Christians by our attitude toward sin. Secondly, by the things that satisfy us. Three, by our attitude toward other people. And four, by our attitude toward God's church. You will be happy to know that I have come to the final point. Point number five. Point number five. What does it say? Others will know that you are Christian by your fruits. Jesus says, by their fruits, you shall know them. The world is looking at us. Yes, the world is looking at us. Do they see Christian fruits coming out of our lives? The trouble with Christianity is Christians. We are told that where we, I think we were in a, one of the Saturday morning study, the men reminded how Mahatma Gandhi almost became a Christian. He went to a Christian church in South Africa and he was not received at all. And you know what happened? And he said he has no problem with Jesus. He has problems with Christians. No problem with Jesus at all. The problem, the trouble with Christianity is Christians. A certain man once said, I have an awful temper. Well, one of the fruits of a Christian is meekness, which is just the opposite of a bad temper. What do others see in our disposition? What do others see in our behavior, in our conduct? Do they know that Jesus is our master? Remember what Jesus says, by their fruits, you shall know them. Of course, one of the fruits of the Christian life is service. How are you serving in your church? Has your life made a difference in any area of the church's work? Remember too that faithfulness is one of the fruits of the Christian life. In every church, you will find some people who do not like something about the church. And what do you think they do? They quit coming, they quit giving to the church, they quit serving, and they criticize. Are they Christians? The true Christian will let nothing keep him or her from God's house and God's service. This is God's business. So, there you have it. It does not matter how long you have been coming to Emsley. It does not matter what position you hold. Or how deeply involved you think you are. It does not matter how spiritual you may think you are. How does the world see you? Does the world know that you are a Christian? And how may the world know that we are Christians? So here we are then. Finally. Others may know. Are you with me? Point number one. 
Come on, tell me, tell me. Others may know that we are Christians by our attitude toward sin. Secondly, others may know that we are Christians by the things that satisfy us. Three, others will know that we are Christians by our attitude toward other people. And fourthly, others will know that we are Christians by our attitude toward God's church. And finally, others will know that we are Christians by our fruits. If we have been with Jesus, then there must be a change in our lives. Bow your heads with me. A moment of silent examination. Just examine your life in silence before God. Gracious God, we have come to worship you today out of varied circumstances. Your searching and penetrating spirit alone can know our different circumstances. Lord, some of us are young and some are older people upon some the blessing of unbroken family circles rests and some have experienced sorrow lately some have lately laid their dead away and beside the grave they have cried they have shed tears they still remain lonely. Some, dear Lord, are happy. And some are storm-tossed. They have troubles in their lives, Lord. They have concerns, anxieties, and fears. And we have named some of those persons before you today. Ella Kay, Helen, Ruby, young Peter, Rachel, Wilbur, Mike, Tony Bernard, do surgery, Noel Smith. We name before you three year old Cristiano the challenges that they face. So, Lord, there are those among us and connected with us who are storm-tossed with anxiety and fear and worry, concerns about their health. Oh, God, we ask you to lift upon them your benediction today, your blessing, and give them the peace and the calm of your saving spirit. Let them grow calm in your presence, knowing that you are with them wherever they are at this moment upon their journey. Make the Christian life real in our private lives. Let all that is worst in us sink. Let all that is best in us rise. Make the Christian life real in your church in this place. Let not Pentecost fail within and among us. Renew the inner spirit of Jesus the Christ in your church, O oh God. His humility, 
his generosity and goodwill, his boundless care for all, his freedom from narrow prejudice, his Christ-like spirit, that your church, Lord, may be worthy of your name. Make the Christian life real in our homes, in the society at large, that there may be justice and peace and love and righteousness, right living. And so, Lord, we worship you today, and we have been privileged to dwell upon the heights and to make acquaintance another time with you in worship and with the loveliest that we ever know. And Lord, because we have spent this time in worship today in your presence, may we go away from this place wiser to solve our problems stronger to do our duties and lovelier to live with at home may we all take this message today lord and apply it to our lives and where we need to be corrected lord as to open ourselves and to allow your word correct us that we may live to your honor and glory and the advancement of your kingdom. We ask all these things in the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and the church.